Hello, I'm Derek Walker. I'm the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church. Last time, we introduced the nine gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we are continuing in this series investigating the, gift, the wonderful supernatural gifts of the Spirit. Let's read. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills, as the Spirit wills. And so the, we learn from this passage that these are special, supernatural manifestations of the Spirit under the Spirit's sovereign control. They operate according to His will, His initiative. It says the Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one as He will. So they're not initiated by the will of man. You can't make the gifts happen. However, they operate through us, and so they require our cooperation. It says the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he will. So it doesn't happen apart from us. And so we have a part to play. We can desire these gifts, we can prayerfully make ourselves available for the Spirit to use us as a channel for these gifts, or not. Moreover, if the Spirit imparts a gift to us, we can choose to yield to it, or we can refuse. We can block it. The passage shows that there's a diversity of ways in which the Spirit can move through us, but it's the same Spirit who works through all of us in all these different ways. These ways however, fall into nine categories of manifestation, and we're going to study them one by one. They're listed in a definite order, and the highest ones are listed first. The nine gifts consist of three groups of three gifts each. They categorize nicely into three threes. First, the utterance gifts, or the inspiration gifts. That's the spirit of speaking, supernatural speech. That's prophecy, different kinds of tongues and interpretation of tongues. Then there are the power gifts, the spirit of doing, supernatural power to affect a change in the natural order. That's the gift of faith, the uh, gifts of healing, and the working of miracles. And then there are the three revelation gifts, which is the spirit of seeing, being able to see and understand supernaturally. That's the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. So let's define these gifts in turn, and as the series goes on, we'll look, have a serious look at each one of them. The word of wisdom is a supernatural revelation by the Spirit of God, God's, sorry, by the Spirit. That's, the word of wisdom is a supernatural revelation by the Spirit of God's plan and purpose. It reveals God's will for the future, giving wisdom for now as to how to act and direct one's life. It is a word or a small portion of God's wisdom that is needful for that time. The word of knowledge is a supernatural revelation by the Spirit of certain facts in the mind of God, things that have happened in the past or are happening in the present, and it's a small portion or a small word of God's knowledge. It's knowledge concerns past or present facts. So God has all knowledge, but the word of knowledge is a small portion of God's knowledge that he deems it necessary for us to know. It's a supernatural knowledge. The gift of special faith is a portion of God's faith imparting the ability to trust God for something that's beyond the faith we can receive from the Bible alone. It operates by believing in the heart and speaking it with our lips, knowing that God will bring it to pass. The gifts of healings are supernatural impartations of divine healing power to someone's body to remove sickness and restore health, and it requires no faith on the part of the recipient. 
The working of miracles is a supernatural intervention causing a miraculous change in the natural order, which is mediated by some physical act of obedience rather than just a spoken word. And so, with the gift of healing, with, sorry, with the, um, the, the gift of faith, you receive a miracle. You believe it and you receive it and you speak it. But the working of miracles, you actually, the miracle happens through you, through your physical action, the miracle is accomplished. Then we come to the gift of prophecy. That's a supernaturally inspired utterance in a known tongue to exhort, edify, and encourage. The gift of prophecy by itself does not contain revelation. It might carry a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge, uh, but in itself, the gift of prophecy is just inspired utterance. If there's any revelation in it, supernatural revelation, that's actually one of the revelation gifts, perhaps included within the prophecy. The discerning of spirits is what gives insight into the spirit world, the ability to see, as it were, into the spirit, seeing angels, demons, the Lord, by this gift, we receive divine dreams and visions. The gift of tongues is inspired supernatural utterance in an unknown tongue, whereby God speaks to man. Now, this gift of tongues is different from normal praying in tongues, because in praying in tongues, man speaks to God with the help of the Holy Spirit, and this operates under the control of our will. We can pray in the Spirit whenever we want to. But the gift of tongues, again, is a supernatural gift as the Spirit wills. And then finally, the interpretation of tongues is a supernatural giving forth of the meaning of a previous utterance in tongues. And so having listed the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul then teaches us how we can prepare our hearts to be available to God to be used in these gifts, because we do have a part to play. We don't initiate them, but we can be ready to move in them. And there are two conditions that are necessary for the Holy Spirit to be able to flow through us freely. And these are described as two ways, two ways into flowing in the gifts. And both of them are important and good. They work together. These two ways are firstly to covet or greatly desire the gifts to work in your life. And secondly, to be motivated by love. And that's described as the more excellent way into the gifts. That's of the two, that's the crucial one, because if you do, if you walk in love, then that will waken your desire for God to use you in the gifts, because these gifts will be a blessing to, to people. Having described these gifts then and ministries in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 30, in verse 31, Paul explains the way to move into these gifts, into moving in these gifts. He says, but earnestly desire, covet, be zealous for the, the best gifts. So that's the first thing, first way into the gifts, earnestly desire. And the Corinthians were doing that. What is the best gifts? I think the best gifts are the gifts that fit best, that enhance your ministry. And also, it would be the gifts that are most needed in that particular situation. And so he says, earnestly desire the best gifts, and, here's the second one now, and I will show you a yet more excellent way. Some translations say, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. It'd be better to say, and yet I, I show you a yet more excellent way. So, desiring the gifts is excellent, but this is a more excellent way. This is what should come first in your seeking to move in the gifts. See, the Corinthians were already fulfilling the first requirement of being zealous for the gifts. They were well known for that. And Paul was encouraging them to continue in that. He was saying, yes, that's an excellent way, but they weren't actually walking in love. So he's saying, you're still lacking something. I want to show you a more excellent way into the gifts. That, and that was to be to pursue love, to be motivated by love. And he develops this issue in 1 Corinthians 13. In fact, that's the whole point of this whole chapter. And of course, that's a very famous chapter about love, but we forget often that the context of it is moving into the gifts. 
the, re the reason in this case that we should let love rule is that that's the best way into moving in these gifts. It's important to understand that in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul isn't contrasting the gifts with love as if they're in competition, as many seem to interpret it, but when they say, oh, well, the fruit of the Spirit, love, is more important than the gifts of the Spirit, obviously. So therefore, we should ignore the gifts and just focus on the fruit. You know, that's illogical. It's not a case of either or, but a case of both. The gifts and the fruit belong together. Because walking in love, you see, towards the lost and those in need, will cause you to desire to receive supernatural gifts from God with which to bless them. And through those gifts, you can bring them into a new awareness of God's love for them. And so these gifts are necessary as ways in which love can be expressed in a powerful way, an effective way to help people. See, without gifts, love is well-meaning but powerless. On the other hand, of course, Paul uh, describes the limitations of these gifts if they, uh, if they are without love. So the answer is to have both, both love and the gifts that express that love and make it effective. So Paul is saying, you know, it's good, you Corinthians, that you desire to be used in these spiritual gifts, but you need to combine that with the most excellent way into the gifts, which is love. Of course, love is most excellent, more excellent than simple desire, because love is unselfish. Love is the greatest and highest thing of all. But the desire by itself, of course, is, is selfish. However, also, when we follow after love, love for God and love for people, it will activate our desire. Why? We want to be effective for God. We want to fulfill the Great Commission and be effective in that, and the gifts will help to do that. And also, we'll have a desire to bless people, to help people come into the presence of God and understand His love and His power for them, and that's where the gifts come in. So walking after love will cause us to desire the gifts to flow through us because those gifts can, can reach people with the power of God. And so by following the most excellent way of love, we, will also, fulfill, we also fulfill the other condition, which is to desire those gifts. So if we just pursue love, we'll end up desiring those gifts to express that love. And so he finishes chapter 12 by saying, concluding, earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And then chapter 13, he describes the excellency of love and why it needs to be our governing motivation for us to move into the gifts if we are to bear eternal fruit for, for God. And then having done that chapter 13, he concludes his discussion in chapter 14 verse 1. That's where the chapter break should have been by saying, pursue, follow after love, and desire spiritual gifts. So you see, having asserted the primacy and the supremacy of love, he now again states those two ways, but he puts them in their rightful order. He says, first, love, and then, second, stir up your desire for these gifts. Let God fill your hearts with his love, and his compassion for people, and then we will desire to be used by him in the supernatural gifts of the Spirit to bless them. We'll make ourselves available to the Holy Spirit to use us, and we will start more to, re if, we, if we walk in love, we'll start to reach out to him to receive these gifts for other people. You know, this is described, this reaching out to God, for the gifts for other people is described in Hebrews 4.16. It encourages us to come with confidence to the throne of grace from where his gifts of grace come from and are given. We can come with confidence if we know that God is good, that he's a generous, liberal, rich giver, and he wants to give his gifts of grace more than we want to receive them. And he, so he encourages us to come boldly with that confidence, not just to receive answers for our own needs, but also to receive gifts 
of the Spirit to minister to others in their time of need. Let's read that. Let's therefore come boldly with confident expectation to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy, for, that's to believe we receive mercy for ourselves, and secondly, to find grace to help in time of need. To find grace to help others, this is, in their time of need. Notice, first, that obtaining mercy is when we receive from God for ourselves, based on our covenant with God. We know what we need, and with his promise established in our heart, we can come to God and believe we receive. We can obtain what we need. We know what we need, we can believe we receive it. That's Mark 11, 24. What sort of things you desire when you pray? Believe that you receive them and you will have them. In this way we obtain mercy from the throne by the prayer of faith. And that means we leave the throne room with that answer in our hands. We obtain it. But the second part of the verse is different where it says we are also to find grace to help, to help others in times of need. Come boldly to the throne of grace to find or discover grace to help others in their time of need. This grace is a grace gift. It's a gift of the Spirit. We're to come and to discover what gift they need, and as God imparts a gift to us, we can use it to help them in their time of need. This is talking about praying for others in their need, you see, in, uh, in this case also, we come with boldness. Why? Because it's a throne of grace, and we know that God desires to bless and help that person, be gracious to them, um, you know, because it's a throne of grace, because Jesus has put, already purchased every blessing for them by his blood. And so when others are concerned, we often don't know, you see. When we know our, what we need, we can obtain it, through our covenant with God. But with others, it's different. We don't know for sure exactly what they need or what's the best way to help them. So instead of coming to God and obtaining it by the prayer of faith, we're to come to God to find grace or a grace gift that will help them in their time of need, to give them well-timed help from God. And the word translated find, find grace, is eurisco, which means to search and discover. That's where we get the word eureka. You know, when, uh, when you have made an amazing discovery, you cry out, Eureka, like Archimedes did. It's a discovery. We come and discover grace. So not knowing what we need, we come with confidence to God, knowing that God knows what they need at that time. And by seeking and searching the heart of God, we can discover uh, and receive the grace gift of the Spirit that we can then use to help them in their need. So it encourages us to reach out to God for his gifts to flow through us to help people in need. If we let ourselves be motivated by love, then we'll come to God in prayer. We'll enter into this spiritual dimension of the gifts on a more consistent basis. Let's go now to 1 Corinthians 13. And let's see how Paul sets forth this more excellent way of love as the best basis for entering in to the gifts of the Spirit. Notice in this chapter, he, although he is building up love, the importance of love, he never discourages us from moving in the gifts, but rather he wants us to be led by love into the gifts. And this chapter should really have started in chapter 1231 with the opening statement, and it should actually finish with chapter 14 verse 1 as the concluding statement. So that's how we're going to read it. In the, in the introductory statement, again, he says, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way into the gifts. Then chapter 13, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, that's the ins an inspiration or utterance gift, but have not love, I've become like a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. You're just a noise to, in God's ears. And though I have the gift of prophecy, that's another inspiration gift, and understand all mysteries, that's a revelation gift called the word of wisdom. Because mysteries are divine secrets and concerning the future. And it's a, that's the word of wisdom. It's a portion of the wisdom of the one who has all wisdom. So he says, 
I might understand all mysteries. I might be proficient in the word of wisdom. And all knowledge. And that's referring to the revelation gift called the word of knowledge. A portion of God's knowledge. The God who, kn who knows has all knowledge. And then he says, and though I have all faith. I want you to notice the context of the chapter is the gifts of the Spirit. And it's all about the gifts of the Spirit. And how we must be motivated by love as we move in the gifts of the Spirit. So he says, though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And so this all faith is the power gift. It's a portion of God's own faith, because God has all faith. So notice he says, but without love, even though we're totally proficient in all the gifts, if I have not love, I'm a big zero. So in these two verses, God, Paul has used two utterance gifts, two revelation gifts, and one power gift to say that even if we're proficient in all these gifts, we, if we have no love, we're just making an unpleasant noise in God's ears. And worse than that, we are nothing. So our greatness, our stature in God, is not measured by our giftedness, but by our love. Then he adds, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profits me nothing. So even if I move in all the gifts and do great things, if I have no love, not only am I nothing, but I will receive no profit, I'll receive no eternal reward. So don't be puffed up in pride if God uses you in a great way in the gifts, because in the end, you won't be measured by that or rewarded by that. You'll be measured and rewarded by your love. And that's the thing that will, the main thing that will last forever. So without love motivating your a work, it does not have any enduring value. Paul then gives his famous description of love in verse 4 to 7. And that describes the kind of spirit and motivation an attitude we should have when we minister the gifts of the Spirit to people. Love suffers long and is kind. Love doesn't envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. In other words, love is eternal. The gifts are temporal. They will fail one day. So love is the highest thing. So we should aim first to be moved by love, and then let love move us into the gifts. Then he says, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. That's the utterance gifts. Whether there's a word of knowledge, it will vanish away. That's the revelation gifts. Then he says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. In other words, the gifts are partial. They're only limited portions of God's grace. A word of knowledge is a, is a portion of God's knowledge. Same with the word of wisdom, a portion of his wisdom. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part, that's the gifts of the Spirit, will be done away. So in eternity we'll enter perfection, where there'll be no lack of anything. All the blessing of God is in full manifestation, so there'll be no need anymore for these portions of God's Spirit that we know as the gifts. And so they'll be done away. But on the other hand, love, love will never fail. It will continue as the supreme reality for all eternity. And so we should follow after love as the highest, the main thing in our life. And then in verse 11, he compares the transition from this earthly life into eternity to the transition from childhood to adulthood, manhood. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now it sounds like the gifts of the Spirit are called childish. But really, it'd be better translated, the things pertaining to childhood. When we enter into eternity, we put away the things pertaining to this, this life. And so we put away child things. We put away the things that pertain to our childhood state. But right now, we need the gifts of the Spirit. But the time is coming when we'll put them away because they won't be needed anymore. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know as just as I am known. And this mirror is God's word. That's how we see spiritual realities now. But it's only a partial knowledge, very limited. And so the gifts of revelation are, make a tremendous difference in this present life, because we're living under such limitations. 
in eternity, of course, we'll have access to the source of all knowledge and wisdom. We'll see him face to face. We'll have perfect first-hand knowledge of God and all things. So the gifts of the Spirit won't be needed. They'll pass away, but love is eternal and that will have far greater value. So we should aim to be filled with love, controlled by love, and let the desire for the gifts come out of that. Now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. These three are the three highest etern and eternal motivations that we need to pursue, faith, hope, and love, if we want our life and our works to have eternal value. And of course, love is the supreme one. The th these are the three keys to enter into the gifts. First, love causes us the desire to be used by God to help others, causing us to come to him and open ourselves to him to receive a gift for them. Then second, by faith, we receive the gift that God imparts to us, which then gives birth to the hope, the confident expectation, the vision of a positive outcome when we release the gift, knowing that as we step out of faith, Step out in faith and minister the gift to the person. The Spirit will powerfully move to touch and transform their heart and lives. And so motivated by love and encouraged and directed by hope, we release the Spirit gift by the obedience of faith. And so having presented love as the most excellent way into desiring the gifts, Paul makes his final summation and conclusion in chapter 14. He says, therefore, pursue love and desire the spiritual gifts. I'd like to introduce you to two of my books that will lead you into a deep understanding of God's Word. The Panorama of Prophecy is my big book on end time prophecy. It gives all the, the prophecies of the Bible and it will take you step by step into exploring this exciting part of God's Word. And also The Keys of Time is the Bible chronology that describes the Bible from beginning to end. And it, in its perfect timing, showing the sovereignty of God. You can get these books from www.oxfordbiblechurch.co.uk or by phoning us at 01865 515 086. Thank you for watching. You can watch more of our teachings on our Oxford Bible Church Roku channel and Derek Walker YouTube channel. You're most welcome to join us at our church services which are every Sunday at 11am and 6pm at Cheney School, Headington, Oxford, OX3 7QH. You can order CDs, DVDs, books and other great products from our online shop at www.oxfordbiblechurch.co.uk where you can also make a donation to our ministry or contact us on 01865 515 086.